It's what a beautiful reading from Romans 12. And thanks, Claire, for reading. And we've had it from two versions. And it, it, it's so good to hear from two versions this morning. I, I think it's always good practice to read more than one version of the scripture because it, it gives us more perspective, more context from God's word. And it's really helpful. And certainly when I'm preparing for, for talks and that kind of thing, I, I, I use loads of different versions of the Bible as source material. And, and it, it's good for us not just to read just, just one version. I've read this passage, it's not surprising, I've read this passage from Romans 12 several times this week, loads of times. And one of the things that struck me as I was reading this passage was Paul is actually encouraging us to do and to be true to the character of God. And as I read verse, verses 9 and verses 11, and, and Josh, thanks for putting that on the screen. If you look at those few words there, those few verses, as you look at that, we can look up and actually see the character of God. We can see that his love for us is genuine, it's sincere. We know that God hates what's evil. We know that he clings to what is good. We know that he is devoted to each one of us in love. And he honours every one of us and is never lacking in zeal. So as we read Paul's words of encouragement and challenge to us, we can really see in those opening verses the true character of God. Paul isn't asking us in a way to do anything radical, anything different, anything against what God's will is or what God's nature is. He's asking us to be like God in our character. So as we look up to God, we have this series, Up, In and Out, over these weeks leading up to Christmas. As we look up to God, he wants us to have the same, the same nature, to have that genuine love. He wants us to hate evil. He wants us to cling to what is good. He wants us to be devoted to each other. He wants us to honour everyone and be never lacking in zeal. And so as we take this on, as we take this in, in the characteristics, and that, that we can take that in, we can take that looking up to God, we can take in to ourselves what he wants us to be. And then we can demonstrate those characteristics, that nature, in our relationships out to each other, to the world. So what I'm looking at this morning is that we get the up and the in and the out intimately linked. But today we're focusing, as, as from the um, sermon program, we're focusing a little bit more on the out. The out, loving outwardly is the theme for this morning. So before we go any further, it, it's, it's great to say, yes, we're going to love, and we're going to love outwardly. But we say to ourselves, how do we do it? How do we love like God? And I think at this point, we've got to go back a few verses. They are, you're, you're steps ahead of me, Josh, to Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. Oh, there it is. <laughs> It says there, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. The reason that people who don't yet know Jesus, that they do not respond to Christian truth, is that they cannot discern spiritual truth. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is a call for the unbeliever to repent of sin and embrace Jesus by faith. And it's interesting, and you probably all know this anyway, but the Greek word translated to a, to, as repentance, it carries with it the idea of a change of mind. A change of mind. Our thinking must be changed. Our thinking must be transformed. 
from old ungodly ways and into ways of thinking new godly ways. So what we know in our minds to be true forms a conviction in our hearts of that truth. And that makes sense. What we know in our minds to be true forms a conviction in our hearts of that truth. And that conviction in our hearts translates into action. Therefore, we must first be renewed by the transforming of our mind. And the only way for us to replace the error of the world's way of thinking is to replace it with God's truth. God's truth revealed in the infallible source of God's word, the Bible. So for us to have the ability, for us to have the capacity, for us to have the desire to love God as he intended to, that we should do, we must be renewed by our minds and we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. So with that as a kind of preamble, let's move back to verses 9 to 21 in chapter 12. Love in action is the heading in my version of the Bible. And Paul starts with this as a firm foundation for it all. He said, love must be sincere or love must be genuine, depending upon what version you look at. We are called to live a life of love in response to what is God's amazing love and mercy to us. So our love is responding to God's love, shown in our unmerited salvation on the cross of Jesus. Let me take a sideways step. How do you know an apple tree is an apple tree? Just think about that. How do you know an apple tree is an apple tree? It seems like a silly question in a way. How do you know an apple tree is an apple tree? The answer is, obviously, and I, and I know you're all just a little bit nervous about shouting out the obvious answer, just in case I was looking for something a little bit more devious. Yes. The answer is, how do you know an apple tree is an apple tree? It produces apples. Yeah, it wasn't that difficult, was it? <laughs> you see the result. You see the apples on the branches. It's an apple tree. And so, let me move that back then. It's just like that with a genuine Christian. The person who's been grafted into Jesus will seek to do the will of God. And Jesus, and, and Jesus said in John chapter 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. And the, the commandments of God just require two things of us. Love for God and love for one another. And that includes our love for people who don't yet believe in Jesus. So another, way, another word that Paul uses in different translations, it says, let your love be sincere, let it be genuine. And he says, let your love be without hypocrisy. Our love must be sincere. Our love must not be a facade, a show, a sham. We must not simply pretend to love. As Christians, we have been transformed to live lives that are renewed by the power of God's love. And such love, if we are transformed by the power of God's love, that spurs us on to love others. So we offer ourselves as living sacrifices of thankfulness to God. Paul then goes on to show us what this love looks like. And, and as you've read, I keep forgetting we've now got, I keep looking round and I shouldn't do that. We've now got this screen I've been looking around for so many years. It's just a, it's just a sort of auto reaction now. <laughs> Twisted neck. I don't need... It's almost a pantomime thing, isn't it? Behind you! <laughs> it's not. It's in front of you. Oh, dear. Uh, so, Paul in, in uh, Romans chapter 12 goes on to tell us what that genuine love looks like. And as you read this chapter... It may be an eye-opener to you. It may not be an eye-opener to you. I, I don't know. But as you read this chapter, you realise how close this chapter is to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. And on the screen, which I'm looking at in front of me, yeah, there, there we are. There's the Beatitudes from Matthew chapter 5. Here they are. They're up there on the screen. I'll, I'll just run through them really quickly. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of things against you because of me. The Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, straight from the words of Jesus, from the Sermon of the Mount, they are beautiful. And it's, no, it, 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 it's really no play on words that the Beatitudes really are the beautiful attitudes. They really are the beautiful attitudes. But in Romans 12, Paul brings meaning and application to what it says in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 tells us what to do to be loving in the way that God wants us to love. And Romans chapter 12 tells us how to love. And that combination shows us the perfection and the completeness of Scripture. And this is an interesting aside because I got starting to think about this. I was thinking, did Paul write Romans chapter 12 after he'd read Matthew uh, chapter 5 and he decided that he would, he would um, just expand on what Jesus said in, in Matthew 5? So did he sit there with his Bible reading it and, and, and write? Actually, no. And this again is the perfection of God working it all out for us. Because the Gospel of Matthew was probably, scholars are not quite sure about this, the Gospel of Matthew was probably written about 80 or 90 AD. It's very unlikely that it was written at all before 70 AD because things are, that, 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 are, that appear in it. But Paul wrote the letter to the Romans probably in around 55 to 57 AD. So Paul actually wrote to the Romans before Matthew wrote his Gospel. Paul didn't have Matthew's gospel as reference material when he wrote Romans. Now, he probably knew from talking to other people all about the Sermon on the Mount and that kind of thing, but he didn't have it there as his reference text when he was writing to the Romans. And yet Matthew 5 and Romans 12 complement each other so absolutely perfectly. That, I think, is amazing. And that just shows us the truth that all scripture is God-inspired. It is fantastic. I don't know whether you'd ever thought about that and the timelines, but it's the kind of stuff that goes on in my head. So, we know that there are Ten Commandments. We're all familiar that there are Ten Commandments. We've just read the Beatitudes, and if you count them, there's nine of them. In this remarkable passage that Paul has written to the Romans, we can see around... 25 commands from Paul about how to be loving outwardly. It's about 25 commands in there. Now that depends a little bit again on which version of the Bible you read and how you break down the actual phrasing and the sentences. But it's about 25. Someone has done it to make actually 31. And what they've done is they've actually put that into a calendar. So each one of the commands in Romans chapter 12, they put it into each one of the days of the month for a calendar. I think that's really quite neat. I couldn't get to 31, so I only got as far as 25. And I don't know any months that have only got 25 days in them, so it, I'm, I'm not going to go down that route. But I want to show you. If you don't believe me, it's here on the screen in front of me and in front of you. So here, here it goes. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good. That 
breaking it down for me, comes to 25. And that is a brilliant how to work out the Beatitudes that Jesus gave us in Matthew 25. Uh, Matthew 5. Jesus told us what to do. Paul is telling us how to do it. There is so much in this passage. Thank you, Claire, for reading it twice. We could do with it more. And we've kind of done it again here, just running through it, but it's just been represented to, 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 to say what Paul is commanding, exhorting, encouraging, challenging us to do. But there is so much in this passage. What we're doing this morning is only scratching the surface of what it means to be loving outwardly. So I say, what will affect what effect will these commands or these exhortations, these encouragements have on your life as you listen to this morning? As you're listening to me speak, what effect will they have on you? Well, quite simply, it'll have absolutely no effect if you don't relate them personally to yourselves and pray for God's empowering grace to apply them in our day-to-day life. It won't mean anything if we don't pray them into our lives. Someone said this, I think I, I thought this was really helpful. We gain nothing speeding 60 miles an hour past a fruit grove or an ice cream shop. We must stop, slowly taste each action of flavour for daily living. In a way, this morning, we're speeding at 60 miles an hour through this passage. I'd encourage you to please stop and take it in. The Bible is so important to us. So often we find reasons why we don't read it. So often we will speed read it. So often, just to tick the box, have you read the Bible today, we'll open it, read a couple of verses, put it back and say, I'm, I'm done. Let me give you an idea as to how important reading our Bible is. Some of you read UCB's Word for Today. It just so happens that Word for Today, today, is entitled, Do You Love God's Word? And I want to read you a little bit of this. An anonymous author has written this about the Bible. Now, if ever you trivialise, if ever you underestimate, if ever you undervalue the Bible, listen to this. The Bible contains the mind of God. It contains the state of man, the way of salvation, the fate of sinners, and the happiness of believers. It is a light to direct you, It is food to nourish you and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveller's road map, the pilot's compass, the soldier's weapon and the player's game plan. It is a mine of incredible wealth and a river of genuine joy. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true and its decisions are immutable. Christ is its grand subject, your good its design, and the glory of God, its end. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. Practice it to be spiritually healthy. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. Let it fill your memory, let it rule your heart, and let it guide your steps. It is given to you in life. It will be open to you at the judgment, and be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labour, and judge those who trifle with its sacred contents. It goes on to say, the Bible, and quotes from 1 Peter chapter 1, the Bible, the word of our God, which will stand forever. Most of us respect the Bible. The trouble is we don't read it daily and put it into practice. And I, I love this. After hearing a discussion on various translations of the Bible, one man said this, I prefer my mother's translation because she translated it into everyday life. I prefer my mother's translation of the Bible because she translated it into everyday life. So we've ran at 60 miles an hour through Romans chapter 12. I'm, I'm going to ask... I'm going to yeah, all right. I'm going to ask you, if you will read, meditate and pray on this passage sometime after you get home. And I'm going to ask you to do something. 
Will you stand with me? I don't mean physically stand, but will you stand with me on this? Will you agree to do this? And I'd just ask you, Romans 12, verses 9 to 21, you can read the whole chapter if you really want, because it's brilliant, but when you get home, or sometime convenient after you've got home, will you read that chapter? Will you pray about it? Will you meditate on it? Will you let it soak into you? And will you commit yourself to do that this morning by raising your hand? I'm going to do this. Will you do that when you get home? Will you read this and let it become yours? And at home as well as you're watching this, sitting on the sofa or wherever you are, I ask you to do exactly the same. Will you raise your... You're already at home, so you can just pick it up and do it now. (laughs) But... Will you raise your hand and commit yourself to just let this passage soak into you? Because there is so much in it about how to love. Let's just quickly go back to the beginning of the passage, back to verse 9, where it says, love must be sincere. What does it mean to be sincere? Our English word for sincere actually comes from a Latin word, sincerus, which means without wax. Some of you may know that. Sincerus means without wax. And it comes from a practice of the early Roman merchants who set their earthenware and their porcelain jars out for sale, out for stall in the markets. And if a crack appeared in one of those porcelain jars, what they would do, they would fill the crack with wax that was the same colour as the jar. So a buyer would pick it up and have a look at it, not be aware it was cracked and buy it thinking that it was perfect. But clever buyers, astute buyers, what they would do, they learned to hold the jars up and they held them out in the sun and if the jar was cracked and if it had been, the crack had been filled with wax, the wax would melt and the crack would be revealed. So the honest merchants would test the wares that they sold this way and they would mark them sincerus. It meant without wax. Okay, so it's a question we can ask ourselves this morning. Are we without wax? Are we sincere in our love? Sincerus. Are we sincere in our, in our love? Jesus said in John chapter 13, it says, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, the greatest act of spiritual service was love. And he said, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Supremely, love is the backbone of everything that we do. How much love depends on how close we want to get to Jesus. As we were praying this morning, it was interesting. One of the prayers this morning was for us in this service to be close to Jesus. And the prayer went along the lines of, there's no blockage from God's part. God wants to get close to us. It's us. How close do we want to get to God? Let me use this as an example. I've never been to Niagara Falls. Some of you may have been. I've been relatively close, but I've never actually been to Niagara Falls. But I do know that there are several vantage points around Niagara Falls that give a really special view of the falls themselves. And there's a fenced border on both sides, on the American side and on the Canadian side. There are hotel views from the Canadian side. There's a tower view, restaurant, and all that kind of thing on the Canadian side. But the best view of the Niagara Falls, I'm told, is from the Maid of the Mist. Mm -hmm. It's a boat ride where they provide you with ponchos because you literally, they literally take you into the falls. Why am I telling you this? Likewise, how much of Jesus do we want to experience? How much we experience of Jesus is determined by how close we get to him. How close we choose to get to him. Or ask him to come close to us. Because his arms of love are always open to those who seek him. His impact on our lives is determined by the intimacy with him that we choose. So choose to get your poncho on today. Choose to get in that boat. 
Choose to steam under the falls and just let it pour out over you. Let Jesus get so close to you that he just flows over you, in you, through you, rather than looking at Jesus from a mile away. The choice is yours. We love because God first loved us and praise God that he did love us and still loves us. In a few moments, we're going to sing a song, Precious Cornerstone. And the chorus of that song has these words. Just be ready for these words when you come to sing it, because mean these words when you come to sing it. May the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. May the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. Let that pray be our prayer this morning. <coughs> Just finishing. In Acts, in the early church, when those who didn't yet believe in Jesus saw how much Christians loved each other, they were attracted to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So this morning, let me encourage you, challenge you maybe, to do certain things. Seek to draw closer to Jesus. Seek to be more real in your relationship with Jesus. We are called to love ourselves and we're called to love others as God loves us. Eagerly desire to be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Seek to become more like Jesus. There's a song sometimes we sing where the words are, break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. Ask God for our love to be sincere, that we are without wax. Ask God to help us by the Holy Spirit to live in accordance with his will. And ask God to help us to be loving outwardly to all those around us. Amen.